Hi, my name is Jessica Hayes, and I'm a board certified behavior analyst at the L4 Autism Foundation. I'm really excited to share this webinar with you, as this topic has been a passion of mine for several years. Before we get started, I want to let you guys know that if you are planning to purchase CEs that are offered for this webinar, I am going to give two code words that you will need to know when you purchase the CEs. Okay, let's get started. Today we're going to talk about teaching appropriate bathroom usage, not just private bathroom use, but public. This topic is very taboo, hence the name of this project. Just so you guys know, I'm going to say penis multiple times throughout this presentation. So let's just get it right out there from the beginning. Using words like this may sometimes make people feel uncomfortable. Um, it can make this topic difficult to, to discuss and more difficult to teach. How many of you have ever been in the in a public restroom of the opposite sex? Um, ladies, do you guys know what this is? Um, it's a pretty standard urinal that's found in most public men's restrooms. And guys, if you've never been in a ladies restroom, um, this is a sanitary napkin um, tampon dispenser that you can find in most public women's restrooms. Most of us have probably never really taken the time to think about what goes on in public restrooms of the opposite sex because we really just don't have to. Um, but as teachers and caregivers um, and professionals working with individuals with autism, it's something that we really have to think about. There are very clear differences in the physical environment that make it really easy to teach. But the tricky part comes when we talk about the differences in social norms in men and women's restrooms. Um, ladies, in case you didn't know, here's what happens in a men's restroom. Um, they generally avoid eye contact. They choose a urinal that's the farthest away from the other person. They look straight ahead or up and down. Um, they use a urinal with pants up, only opening in the front. They wash up and exit the men's room without engaging in any conversation. Guys. This is your chance to finally find out what goes really goes on in the ladies' restroom. Um, the ladies' room is a far more social place. It's normal to have a conversation with friends and even strangers. We compliment each other. We ask where you have purchased things. We comment on things in the environment. Um, ladies use the toilet with the stall door closed. Conversation generally ceases when, when that happens. Um, but it's not considered weird or suspicious or abnormal to ask someone in another stall to pass toilet paper to you or a tampon, um, even if they're a complete stranger. Besides the differences that we've discussed regarding male and female social norms, these are more problematic behaviors that sometimes we see when working with individuals with ASD. Um, Using the urinal with pants around their ankles, a lot of students take pants down to their ankles, um, exposing their, their butt. Um, and in case you guys didn't know, this is really not typical behavior. Men use the bathroom with their pants up and they just open in the front. Um, we're all familiar with non-contextual speech and self-stimulatory behaviors. But as you can imagine, the general public may find these behaviors strange and potentially unsettling, especially if you're standing next to, next to someone that's standing at the urinal and they're demonstrating some of these type of things. Ladies, looking at your neighbor at the urinal, not an acceptable behavior. Um, when men are using the urinal, they look forward at the wall. This kind of behavior makes the other person feel uncomfortable and could potentially lead to confrontation. Someone peeking in a stall to see whether it's occupied or who's in there, um, this is a problem because it's just, first of all, it's not appropriate. 
we usually take a closed and locked stall door as a cue that the stall is occupied, which is one of the reasons why it's important to close the stall door while occupied. An open stall while using the toilet really exposes the individual. And we're not really going to talk about stall behavior today, but one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that um, when we're, we're starting toilet training, when individuals are young, we generally will help them in the bathroom and we'll leave the stall door open to be able to help if needed. Um, it's really important to start start teaching that privacy and locking the stall door um, needs to happen as soon as you can start teaching that. Some individuals take their clothing off to use the bathroom. Um, this is a behavior that's acceptable in a private bathroom, but as you can ma imagine, is not acceptable in a public restroom, it's really problematic. Um, there can be a lot of issues generalizing behaviors that are acceptable in private restrooms versus public restrooms. Um, public masturbation is a really good example of this. It's a huge issue in itself and probably its own presentation, but individuals with ASD are sometimes redirected to masturbate in, in a bathroom. Um, this is a behavior that can be difficult to appropriately generalize to a public restroom. We don't want them to do this in a public restroom. Researchers in this field suggest avoiding teaching individuals masturbation in any bathroom. And they really recommend that if, when you're teaching masturbation behavior, that you teach the individual to masturbate in their bedroom because it's a really concrete place and that's the one place they can do it and there's no um, potential for misunderstanding there. Um, when men use a urinal, they typically will choose a urinal that's the farthest away from the one that's being used. People are typically used to filling in seats at a restaurant, theater, sporting event, um, etc. And there's a whole formula that men use to determine which urinal to select. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, students also sometimes have difficulty identifying gender specific restrooms, which possibly can stem from using the wrong restroom when on a public outing with a female caretaker. Um, oftentimes, we, when our kiddos are young, we moms and female caregivers bring them into the bathroom when you're at the mall or at, you're at a restaurant um, and they they go into the ladies restroom um, and sometimes even when they're older if an individual maybe needs a little bit more help in the bathroom sometimes they'll moms will take them into the ladies room and this can be really confusing for them to understand whether what bathroom they should be using um, when men use a urinal, again, we, I said that they typically use the one that's farthest away. Um, touching other people is problematic for very obvious reasons. So let's talk a little bit more about the urinal formula because I know you guys are dying to know. So take a look at this picture. There's five urinals here. Um, if they were empty, the first person to enter the bathroom would probably choose the urinal that's the farthest away from the occupied urinal. And then a third person would use the urinal that's the farthest away from both, leaving an empty urinal on either side. This is something that most men don't really even have to think about. They just know. So some of the behaviors that we did, we discussed can lead to some very serious consequences. Some people that are uncomfortable with being around these types of behaviors could potentially become verbally, physically, or sexually aggressive. Um, for example, if someone's looking where they shouldn't be, it can lead to another person becoming aggressive, maybe lead to name calling, having their pants around their ankles, may leave an, individ an individual more susceptible to sexual abuse, 
Um, also, some of these behaviors could be misinterpreted as a sexual advance or proposition. And even more serious consequences, even if more serious consequences don't occur, the individual can be stigmatized socially, which can affect their inclusion into social settings. Um, and then also, some of these behaviors are, are serious enough that they could lead to legal ramifications or um, the person with ASD being labeled as a sexual predator. So definitely, you know, these are some really big red flags of reasons why we really need to teach appropriate bathroom behavior. Individuals who are demonstrating some of these social deficits in public restrooms will be looked at as strange or weird by typically developing peers. Um, even in our setting where all individuals have an ASD diagnosis, we experience social stigma when students who have higher skills in this area encounter a student who does not. Um, students who have not mastered toileting skills will be less likely to gain or hold meaningful employment. And just to um, backtrack a little bit here, um, this project I did while I was a teacher at a um, charter school that was serving high school students with autism spectrum disorders that were ages 14 through 22. So um, oftentimes in this presentation, I'm referring to the individuals um, as students, so that's why. So in this field, a majority of teachers are female, while statistics show that three quarters of students diagnosed with autism are male. Moms are often primary caretakers. Um, women may not be as socially aware of social norms in a men's restroom. Respect for privacy of students. Um, again, this is a topic that people don't really feel comfortable talking about. Um, a lot of these behaviors, like I said, we, we saw in the school setting, um, and then we saw it in the community, and parents also shared with us. So we decided that Project Taboo was really a necessary thing to do. Um, and so for this project, we decided to teach appropriate bathroom use. We used a single subject research design and utilized a multiple probe um, across participants' research design. Um, baseline data was collected on all participants in the intervention. Um, and the, the intervention is implemented with the first participant, participant, sorry and then other participants remain in baseline. Um, when the first participant reached mastery or stable responding, then the other participants have a baseline data probe taken, and then the second participant is introduced to the intervention. The process is repeated until all participants are exposed to the intervention. This is gonna make a lot more sense in a minute when we take a look at the graphs. Um, all students that participated in, in this project met the following criteria. They had a primary diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. They were 16 through 18 years of age, um, enrolled in a public charter school setting that serves students with ASD, and they are able to attend to a video for up to one minute. They have generalized gross motor imitation skills, and they demonstrate demonstrate deficits in social norms associated with public restroom use. The, the dependent variable of what we were measuring were the number of steps correct in our task analysis. Um, we identified what we felt were the most pressing problematic behaviors and created this task analysis. I'm going to show you on the next slide.
So let's take a look at it. Um, we determined that these were the essential skills needed to use the public restroom. Um, face forward at the urinal, open pants and take penis out while keeping pants up in the back. Um, pee in the urinal, pull pants up facing the urinal, flush the urinal, and then have no non-contextual vocalizations during this time in the bathroom. We also want to add here that we added peeing in the urinal because some students were just standing in front of the urinal and Um, our independent variable was our video model. Um, it was created by developing a script using the task analysis, filming the video model using two urinals in a public men's restroom. Um, two male staff members modeled from a third person perspective. And we filmed the video using a GoPro and transferred the video to an iPad for student viewing. Uh, first and foremost, we obtained permission from parents to do this project with their child. Um, this is crucial in projects and topics like this. Train confederates on procedures for data collection. Um, when I refer to confederates, that's the term to describe people that are taking part of a project. Um, the participant does not know that this person is involved. We explained the steps to all male staff in our school, and we were really fortunate at this time to work in a school that had seven male staff. So we had several options when um, choosing Confederates for data collection. We collected baseline data on participants during baseline. Um, sorry, we collected baseline data on participants, and during the baseline, we just sent the students to the restroom to assess their prior skills. Um, they did not watch the video. Some students were removed from the study during baseline because they had already mastered steps of the task analysis, and other students left the bathroom and waited until no one was in there to go back in and use it. And some students left the bathroom and went to use another bathroom so that they could access a stall. Um, when a participant asked to use the restroom, they were taken aside and watched the video model two consecutive times. Whenever someone needed to use the restroom, we called the room where the Confederate was and asked them if they were available to come to take data. So here's our first graph. Um, this is a multiple probe graph, which demonstrates the experimental, experimental design that we used. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about each participant individually. But, we'll, but these graphs indicate the percentage correct in the task analysis. So participant one um, at baseline, the baseline levels were about 30%. Um, he was dropping his pants to the floor every time. He never pulled his pants up facing the urinal, and he would sometimes walk towards the sink when he pulled his pants up while he pulled his pants up. Um, the only things he was doing correctly according to the task analysis was peeing in the urinal and flushing the urinal. Participant two, um, his baseline levels were between 30 and 50% correct responding. At baseline, he was facing forward at the urinal and peeing consistently. However, pants were dropped to the floor and he pulled his pants up facing away from the urinal. He also did not flush. Um, when the intervention was introduced, he increased slightly. Um, when verbal prompts were introduced, it really didn't make much of a difference. The parts that we were most interested in keeping um, in keeping pants up and closing, from, um, closing them while facing the urinal, he still wasn't able to do. Um, we're going to discuss part this participant later and what we did to decrease, increase his responding. An interesting point with this participant was occasionally he would be wearing pants that were difficult to unbutton and would come out to the hallway to request help from me instead of the unfamiliar confederate at the urinal, which I thought was a really um, important. Um, it was good in the sense that he knew not to ask someone that he didn't know in the bathroom for help but also not great that he was reliant on 
coming to have a female staff member help him button his pants. Um, I'm going to stop here for a second because I want to give you our first code word. And our first code word is sunshine. Sunshine. S-U-N-S-H-I-N-E. Sunshine. That's our first code word. Thanks for listening so far and keep listening and I will give you the next one soon. Okay, so let's talk about um, participant three. Um, at baseline, participant three was able to perform about 50% of steps of the task analysis. He was dropping his pants to the floor, um, he wasn't facing the wall, and he was not pulling his pants up facing the wall. At intervention, he increased to 80%. Um, he still dropped his pants to the floor, but did everything else correctly. Two participants showed little to no gain with just video modeling. Um, one participant increased from 50% to 80% with video modeling. Sorry, I did not skip my slide. Here's the graph for participant three. Okay, so back to this. Um, two participants showed little to no gain with just video modeling. Um, one participant increased from 50% to 80% with video modeling. And participants one and two required verbal prompting with the video model to show gains. Um, none of the participants consistently kept pants up while urinating. And in addition of a descriptive verbal prompt, we added the verbal prompt because we didn't see the results we were looking for with just the video modeling. So those were some changes. Um, we ran into some ethical barriers for teaching bathroom skills th through this research project. This, is, this can be really hard to teach. Um, our school policy was that staff were never to be alone with a student in the restroom. So consequ consequently, we, re we required two Confederates each time that data was collected. Um, students had to wait while two Confederates came to get into position for data collecting in the bathroom. So in order to follow our school policy, um, but keep the data collection as natural as possible, one male staff member positioned himself at the urinal like he was urinating, but he kept his pants up. The other staff member was in the stall with a closed door. Students also had to watch the video two times, the video model two times before using the bathroom. So which means they had to wait for both Confederates and to watch the video. Watching the video does give the Confederate some time to get, get to the restroom and pre prepare for data collection. And I wanna say that fortunately, all three participants actually really enjoyed watching the video. Um, after several trials, one student actually requested to watch the video after requesting the bathroom, so that was great. All three of them laughed at different parts of it, and one student verbally repeated each step as if it was narrated. Um, this was also, as, as it was narrated. Um, this also was the student that was the most successful, so I don't know if him giving himself that verbal prompt um, helped at all, but um, other students had to be redirected to other bathrooms. Um, we recognize that these ethical concerns and we realize it can be really intrusive to the individuals. However, we really carefully weighed this against the risks and benefits and determined that this was a priority need to keep our young adults safe in the community. Because we decided to run this project as a research design, we also had to adhere to what the guidelines were for research. So limited, um, so that really limited our ability to make instructional changes on the fly. So instructional barriers, um, although we tried to use data collectors that were unfamiliar, the data collectors were staff that students saw in the school regularly throughout the day. Um, in this school, home, community setting where we typically are able to use visual, verbal, gestural prompting, 
these methods were not conducive to the type of skills that we were trying to, to teach. Data collection opportunities are limited when students only use the bathroom once. Um, male staff are not always available for data collection and have to come from other parts of the, the school to, to come and take data. Um, only one bathroom in the school had access to multiple urinal stalls, so students were only able to access one restroom for data collection. Another reason we had a staff member in the hall was to make sure the student used the urinal during data collection. Um, generalization is a big instructional barrier. It can be really difficult because this isn't something that we can replicate in the community. At school, we were really able to control the environment, but that's not something that you really can do in a community setting. When we identified urinal use training as a priority skill to teach, we brainstormed different instructional strategies. Um, these were all strategies that we tried and we have used them within our school and have found it success. Um, we found that video modeling was one of the most effective for the students we were working with. In an effort to quantify, we decided to do Project Taboo as a research study. So some of the potential effective strategies for teaching bathroom skills are video modeling, um, using self-monitoring checklist, a traditional social story or um, social narrative, um, PowerPoint with a narrative or visual prompting. Possibly using one of the identified strategies to teach um, from the previous slide to teach stall behavior, such as closing the door, locking the door, knocking on closed doors um, versus looking under the stall or peeking. These are some really good ideas for future research. Um, we can also look at comparing effectiveness of different strategies um, or generalization into other public restrooms. Another valuable line of research would be the expansion of video modeling into more bathroom skills, for example, um, wiping, washing hands, female hygiene, um, incorporating social behavior training during initial toilet training in early childhood or parent training for generalization. Um, the, where do we go from here? Um, the intervention is something that's still in progress. We're still working on trying to find what is the best way to teach some of these skills. Um, considering all barriers and the fact that we were in a school setting versus a, a typical clinical setting. Um, we had staff absences, student absences, interfering student behaviors, um, and school vacations. And the length of this intervention wasn't as long as um, we needed it to be to reach the level of student success that would benefit the student. And I just want to talk about this little um, scan code here that I have. Um, that's something that we have used throughout our schools um, at, at times um, to, um, you, it's, you can scan it and it can take you to a video model. So if a student has an iPad or some kind of device, um, they can scan and they can, they can see that as a kind of a prompt to help them know what to do in certain situations. So that's something that you could do um, to give them that video model in, in a restroom setting. Where we are today. So since the research ended without finding results that we hoped for, um, we've continued trialing some other methods to help students reach desired outcomes. Um, because we no longer had to adhere to research design, we were able to implement verbal reminders, picture prompts, and social scenarios. And after sharing the results of this study with the parent of one of the participants, our IEP team created a goal for him. Um, this was a priority need for him as we knew he had a lot of difficulty in this area 
and he was getting older and going out into the community more often and would need to be going going into the community to hold a job and participate in those kind of things. Um, we reevaluated. We reevaluated what are the what the priority needs are when it comes to teaching public restroom skills. And I'm going to discuss a few of these a lot more in a second. But first, I want to tell you a little bit more about what we worked on with the participant I was just referring to. Um, we decided to start with urinal behavior. So the first thing we did was develop his annual um, Sorry, hang on, I wanna go back for a second because I missed talking about this slide. Um, so what we wanna focus on is teaching specific rules of, of public restroom use, urinal behavior, choosing the right urinal, pants up, eyes forward, appropriate stall behaviors, doors closed and locked, um, knowing the gender signs for bathrooms, hand washing as part of toileting, and social skills differences in men's and women's restrooms. And also, of course, generalization to the community. So let's talk a little bit more about the participant um, that I was just referring to. So we decided with him that we were gonna we were going to um, focus on urinal behavior. So this was the goal that was written for him. Um, we developed an annual goal and objectives to help us reach the goal. And because of this being an IEP goal, we really had to be cautious of ethical barriers in case the student ever was transferred to another school setting. So this was the goal. Um, the annual goal was that after using the bathroom, the student would mark off the public restrooms rules he followed on his self-monitoring checklist. Um, the objectives to reach that goal were that daily the student would read a social story related to using a public restroom. Um, objective two was that given a list of five rules for public restroom use, the student would write them in his journal. And objective three, given 10 social scenarios, the student would sort the scenario into an appropriate or inappropriate um, pile. So so then we created the materials that would be needed to teach this goal. Um, I'll give some suggestions for some su supplemental curriculum that can be used uh, a little bit later on. But some materials for teaching um, was a social story related to urinal use, social scenarios, and a self-monitoring checklist. Here's an example of the social story. Um, each morning, the students had the opportunity to work in their independent binders, which contained contained materials related to their IEP goals. This social story was placed in the participant's binder and he had a checklist to follow. So he first read the story, then he wrote the rules in the journal, and finally he sorted his social scenarios. This was uh, this is an example of the social scenario sort. Um, the student had 10 scenarios and sorted them into a inappropriate or appropriate pile. Um, make sure with an activity like this that the students understand what appropriate and inappropriate means. Um, some people might use the words expected or unexpected, um, but just make sure that you're really clear on what those things mean. Um, the scenarios in the appropriate category are a man peeing at the urinal, he's looking straight ahead. A man is pee peeing at the urinal. He keeps his pants up in the back while peeing. You cannot see his butt. A man is standing while he is peeing at the urinal. Or a man is, and also a man is peeing at the urinal. He keeps his, his hands on his own body. A man is uh, peeing at the urinal. He is quiet. Um, the inappropriate scenarios are a man is making comments about the person standing next to him. A boy had his pants around his ankles at the urinal with his butt showing. A man is looking at the person that is, he is peeing next to. And a man is screaming while standing at the urinal. And a man is touching someone standing at the urinal next to him. 
this intervention works really well with this participant. Um, the data for objective one and two um, reach 80% in four out of five opportunities, which we identified as criteria for mastery. Again, it's really important to keep in mind that this intervention may not be successful for all students, so it's really important to try different things. So this is an example of the self-monitoring checklist. Um, I, it said, my restroom checklist journal. After I use the restroom, I will check off the rules that I follow. I use the urinal with my pants covering my butt. I was quiet in the restroom. I washed my hands when I was finished. I faced toward the wall in front of me while I was using the urinal, and I flushed the urinal. This is the next step for the student um, to master the goal. We're still teaching him to review this before he used the, we were still teaching him, sorry, to use this before he used the restroom. And I don't have the, um, updated data for this. This, like I said, this um, project took place a few years ago when I was teaching in a school setting. Um, so some of the other areas to focus on uh, is just teaching the rules. Um, some students may only need a list to follow. This could be posted in the restroom. Um, I, I will choose an empty urinal using the formula. I will face forward at the urinal. I will open my pants only in the front and keep my butt covered. I will stay quiet in the restroom unless someone says something to me. I will button my pants and tuck my shirt before I leave the restroom. Um, teaching safety skills is going to be super important so that students can stay safe. Um, some safety skills for public restrooms are use the appropriate restroom for your gender. Don't make comments on noises coming from other stalls. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, if using the stall, lock the door and definitely teach stranger danger. So why can't we just focus on stall use? We definitely can and should teach how to use a stall appropriately, but um, how to look for an empty stall, closing and locking doors, flushing and exiting are important skills for the restroom. However, we really want to teach all options for restroom use as there are times that a stall may not be available. I think that focusing on the stall use initially is key and when you have reached the mastery in that area, then move on to teaching the basics of your urinal use and then social skills. These are some of the materials that I have used. Um, the social story that I showed a few minutes ago um, actually came from this book, Taking Care of Myself. Um, and Tom Needs to Go is a social story about stall behavior and using the bathroom. Um, I really like Taking Care of Myself also um, because it has a lot of social stories that relate to hygiene, um, puberty, masturbation, and toileting. So there's a lot of really great stuff in that book, and it's an excellent resource. And I believe they just came out with a second um, edition of it um, with even more stuff. So it's definitely something to check out. Don't forget to differentiate instruction. Um, a lot of our students may simply just need more visual support. And something like this can be easily created with board maker or symbol sticks. Um, this says, using the men's restroom, you have a decision to make. Should you use the toilet? Toilets are private. Or should you use the urinal? Urinals are not private. If you pick a toilet, you enter the stall, close the door and lock it, and you pee in the toilet standing up. Or you pee or poo sitting down. If you pick a urinal, you stand close, you undo your pants, but just a little bit, hold your penis and aim and pee into the urinal. Don't pull your pants all the way down. Don't show your bottom when using the urinal. Don't watch other men or boys pee. Don't look at private parts. Don't talk to strangers. 
pull up your pants, wash hands, and leave the bathroom. So teaching generalization into the community, um, you can teach using family bathrooms, um, having male staff members that are able to, male staff members, male parents, male siblings that are able to go into this, the public bathrooms with the student that you're teaching um, or client that you're teaching. Um, you can also teach going into a variety of different settings, planning strategic community trips, um, to the mall, to the baseball stadium, um, to all different types of settings where they will have the opportunity to use a public restroom. So these are just some pictures um, that I have come across. Um, how confusing are signs like this? Um, we see unique signs like this all over. These were found in an art gallery in West Palm Beach. We definitely really need to teach our students with autism how to generalize these signs. I mean, this is a little bit challenging. It says Lisa's and Bob's, and they often are taught men, um, to look for men or women or a picture of, you know, the standard restroom signs, and these can be really challenging. Here's another one. Um, one way to teach generalization of bathroom signs is to show multiple pictures of unique bathroom signs and show the student how to look for examples that would indicate that it's a woman or a man. Um, ladies have longer hair, they might be wearing a dress, um, men are often wearing pants. Um, this was another example from a restaurant, um, I believe it was Brio. Um, in this instance, we would want to teach the student to look for the additional picture. Students can be taught if they aren't sure to hang back and watch for people entering the restroom to determine which room is being used by ladies and which room is typically being used by men. Here's another one, I'm not really sure. Um, where I came across this sign, but boys and gulls um, definitely could be a little bit challenging for our guys to figure out um, which one to use. Um, anyway, I am going to provide my references and I want to give you guys my um, last word. Our, our second code word, and that is April. April. A P R I L, April. And uh, I want to thank you guys all for listening to my talk. And I really hope that you will take some of these teaching strategies into consideration um, as you are teaching and working with individuals with autism. Um, if you have any further questions, you can email me at jessica.hayes at l4autism.org. Thank you again.